Today's guest is Matt Fury, president of the Psycho Cybernetics Foundation that of course comes from Psycho Cybernetics, the international bestseller by author Maxwell Maltz. It is credited with being one of the greatest self-help books of the last century. Matt goes directly in to show us the system and how unique it is, what he did as a young person as he was failing to turn it around to become a champion in several different sports, including Kung Fu in China, and also how he used it to make a fortune. This podcast is full of engaging stories and ways for you to take the system and use it in your everyday life. Everything can be applied. It's easily one of the most influential books I've read this year. You will enjoy every single part of it, especially Especially if you take action. Enjoy the podcast. The way of Will John. Hello, people. We have once again a very special guest. I'm here today with Matt Fury, who is going to give us his own intro into all the stuff he has done. He's a very, very interesting human being, a badass, as we like to have on the channel. So, Matt, what's going on? How are you doing? Thank you, Will. I, uh, I'm here in my home in Florida, looking forward to this call, especially being a fellow athlete. It should be great. Agreed. Agreed. So obviously I came across you from this incredible book, Psycho Cybernetics, and uh, your name is right here on the front of this. So I'll just introduce his new introduction and commentary by Matt Fury, president of the Psycho Cybernetics Foundation. And so wanting to go deeper into this subject, it was obvious to me that I had to reach out. So I'm really happy that we could get you here. Why don't you give us an intro okay. into who you are and then lead us into what psychocybernetics is in general? All right, very good. Well, similar to yourself, I grew up in the Midwest. And I'm from Iowa, you're from Kansas City, Missouri. I came from a small town, 10,000 people. Grew up watching the Royals and the Cardinals and the Cubs and the Twins because they were the teams in the closest uh, proximity to where I live. Um, I got started in sports when I was eight years of age. It started with swimming, wrestling, and baseball. I wanted to become a champion early on, before I even knew it. And one of the things I would do when I would walk to the swimming pool, we had an outdoor swimming pool at the time, is imagine one day being successful. I'd picture this in my mind. And as I would do so, I would imagine that I would be giving a speech, giving talks in front of people about what I did to become successful. I became a champion in swimming first. And even though I'm not long and lanky in terms of my build, I'm five foot nine and short and stocky and muscular, I uh, figured out by watching Mark Spitz in the Olympics and so on, how to perform the strokes much better than the teachers who were coaching me on the team. Uh, somewhere along the line, between age 10 and 14, I became really adamant that the thing I wanted to excel at was the sport of wrestling. So swimming came easier for me than wrestling. Uh, I... I worked hard. I practiced twice a day instead of just once a day. Everybody went to just one practice. I figured, well, if I go to two, maybe that'll help. With wrestling, it didn't come easily for me, but I was intrigued because it, uh, it, it wasn't just about speed. You had to be strong, you had to have good technique, you needed mobility, you had to have strategy. There's so much going on, different body types, different body builds. For every move you learn, there's a counter move, a counter to that counter, and so on. I was intrigued by it, and even though I did not have the natural ability in it, compared to many of the others on the team, 
I was totally locked in and sold on the idea of becoming a champion and then going to the University of Iowa and wrestling for my idol, Dan Gable. And so a lot of you, you may not be familiar with, with him, but most people in the world, especially if they're my age, <laughs> they know who Dan Gable is. Even if they don't follow wrestling, they've heard of him. Um, so around my junior year in high school, I started to get a lot better from going to camps, from reading books, from seeking instruction from others who had been there and done it. I got into my senior year and halfway through the year, even though my goals were quite audacious in terms of being a state champion and wrestling for Gable, uh, midway through the year, my record was eight and four. Hit. You have no shot. You have no <laughs> chance of moving on to collegiate wrestling at really at any level, even JUCO or Division three with that kind of a record. And I came home from this tournament that I had won as a junior. I was really upset with myself, and I grabbed this book from the school library that I had read a number of times before. And it wasn't psycho-cybernetics. This is the U.S. version. You held up the U.K. version, which they're exactly the same, right, but right. different cover for the, U for the U.S. audience. But I, uh, I grabbed this book called The Legend of Dan Gable, The Rest, and I reread this book with the intention of finding the secret. And what I discovered when reading the book is what wasn't written in the book. It's what was between the lines. And Gable talked in there about working out three times a day. So this goes beyond the swimming of two workouts a day. I trained three times a day. But I had been doing most of my training outside of the practice on conditioning, strength, on, on uh, endurance and so on. And I realized my flaw, the thing that's holding me back, is technique. Is that the technique needs to be improved, needs to be sharpened. So as athletes listening to this, if they were baseball players, for example, it would be probably suicidal to go out and throw the ball three times a day. Right. But you can work on the technique of throwing the ball without throwing. You can there's a lot of other things you can do. So I realized that I've got to get on the mat three times a day. Not going to get rid of the conditioning, but make sure in each and every workout, I am on the mat. Prior to this, I was on the mat once a day in two workouts were conditioning. So I, I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. The, we always hear that you, you got to know your technique, like the back of your hand or the palm of your hand. You got to know it so it's unconscious. You don't have to think about it. And you would think that just repeating the same moves over and over uh, would have a point of no return. That at some point it's not going to do you any good. That I found not to be true. That the more I worked on the techniques that I already knew, the sharper they got, the quicker they got. And the faster I was able to execute them in a, in a match, what happened is I went on a roll. I won 15 straight matches. And despite spraining my ankle severely where I, I couldn't even walk, I used the power of my mind and visualization uh, while I was getting ultrasound and ice and everything. Uh, people said, how, how are you even going to compete? in the district tournament, I said, you watch me. And I qualified for the state tournament. I won the first match. Second match, I faced the defending state champion. 
who was a blue chip recruit, and I beat him. And now it's getting interesting. You get into the semifinals, and the number three ranked guy in the in the state who had penned 25 straight guys, I beat him. And now I'm in the finals. And before the finals, which were the next day, I start getting all these phone calls and cards given to me, and they were congratulatory, but also they were telling me that even if you don't win, <laughs> this sort Prepping of thing. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even if you don't win, we're so proud of you. And this affected me. And when I was sitting in the stands pri watching the matches prior to mine, I started to say to myself that you've come a long way. If you don't win, it, it's all right. And all of this sort of thinking. And then I got out of the stands. I started going through my warm up. It, it just wasn't the same. There were things that I did in my warm up. Uh, for example, clasping and unclasping my hands and looking up at the ceiling and the rafters and this, this arena that I had never done before, that I had done before I, the first three matches. And I, you know, I've come to learn over time that there's an energetic thing going on with the brain and the hands. And by doing this, I was actually revving myself up internally, my nervous system and my brain. Before the finals, I didn't do that. And I wasn't looking on. <laughs> and I was just kind of staring straight ahead, having fearful thoughts and so on. Well, I get into the match and I end up losing seven to five. And I'm disappointed because uh, I, I beat the defending champion that everyone said, nobody's going to beat this guy. Now I beat the number of three guy. Now I got a guy who was a junior and I lost. And this was actually a pivotal moment in my life because it got me interested in the breakdown. So I'd already fixed the technical aspect. Now we have another difficult situation to address another weak link in the chain and that is i wasn't used to winning championship in swimming i was but not wrestling i was used to taking second so i took second in the district tournament and then now you're in the state championship and you take second and get well years later four years later when i'm in the finals of the national tournament and I'm sitting in the stand, I'm going through the same thing that I went through as a senior in high school. The same doubting thoughts. So you have high school, now you have college. I'm the number one seed in this tournament, and now I'm having the same kind of doubting thoughts. Well, what happened? I recognized I recognized through awareness that this was a hole. This was a deep pit I was falling into. And if I didn't want the same thing to happen to me that happened in high school, I better get out of the stands and go somewhere else. Mm. So I got, I got out of the first floor of this arena and I walked down a couple flights of stairs and I went into this area where nobody nobody was. And I sat on a chair and I began to visualize and practice theater of the mind before I knew it was called that. And I started going through my match and seeing my hand raised at the end and feeling this sense of celebration and being congratulated by my coaches and so on. And then I fell asleep about 10 or 15 minutes into this. I didn't sleep one second the night before. <laughs> so <laughs> athletes, this happens to. It's common in big pressure situations. And it's no big deal. You don't need to sleep. You actually don't need it. You're in the process of, of uh, accomplishing something big. 
but now I'm falling asleep. And luckily, something, some force woke me up probably after about 10 or 15 minutes. And I immediately ran up to the arena floor and there was another match before me. I, I started warming up, getting ready and uh, went out there and walked away with the title. So if you look at it, there's an approach that works and there's an approach that doesn't. So staying in the stand, going through the same manure that I went through in high school was definitely not the right thing to do. Post-college, I was introduced to this book. This was 1987 by one of my clients that I was training. And he told me, this, this is the Bible, self-development. I had all these other books that I read while in college and, and after college, but I hadn't read this. I went down and I bought it because I wanted to improve my sales and make more money in my business. But what I discovered in reading this book was that I had this feeling of being a failure. Well, how could that be? You won a national title. Well, I won a national title as a junior. My senior year, I didn't win. And I carried that disappointment and that heartache with me all the way to California. And it was still operating in my mind as I had started this business. What I realized is that you have to go back in your mind and remember and review and visualize and relive your positive experiences from the past. It isn't just about the goal. So this is a, what separates psychocybernetics, among other factors, from so many of the self-development programs is they focus on the goal. Just everything is the future. Well, the future is important, but so is the positive past. And what happened is I began doing the exercises and I began reliving the championships that I had won. Not the ones I lost, the ones that I had won that made me feel good about myself. And this practice of doing that before I visualized the goal created a force field of positive energy that when I would walk into a room, people would take notice. So I didn't even say a word, but they would take notice. You start to light up the room you're in because you lit up your brain and nervous system by reliving these happy moments in your life. I then got huge into this and I bought all the other Dr. Maltz books. Think about it, 1987, I had no idea that one day I would actually own this company and be writing the introduction and commentary for this book. It, it's, it's quite mind boggling, but that's how things uh, worked out for me. But I, I then kept using the, the techniques in this for my business. I also got into martial arts and used them to win a world championship in Kung Fu in China, beating them at their own game. So when I came back from China, I realized that I had applied it for my business and for my career in, in the realm of making money, but only at a very small level. The enough to get by, pay your bills, and and so on level. And uh, I had a realization that I worked my ass off to win a gold medal in a martial art. I don't have any negative view of doing that. I don't feel as though I am harming other people or I'm stepping on other people to get to the top in there. But somehow in my mind, I had it coded that if you make a ton of money, that you're not necessarily a good person. 
well, how can you strive to be a straight A student or to win a championship and some and that's fine, but making a lot of money, that's not wait a minute here. So I rewired my brain by picturing things differently and realizing that becoming a champion was the same as becoming a successful business person. Not just enough to exist and pay your bills and pay your taxes and so on, but to actually rise to the top, whatever the top means to you, to achieve something remarkable. I began to apply this in my business. That then led to me fulfilling dreams of uh, publishing, writing and getting books published and audio programs with Nightingale Conant and so on. And then led to changes in all these other areas. The, the, the main thing is all of these changes took place when I shifted the mental picture I had of myself into something much more empowering and much more useful. It's all a mental picture. And this is what psycho-cybernetics is all about, is the self-image. What is the picture you have of yourself? That's what I wanted to get more into, uh, even, because you've mentioned a few times, which, by the way, the story is ridiculous, right? And you, you share a lot of similarities to the way that it worked for me. I stumbled upon, let's say, some form of this, right? And there are many systems, I guess, you, if you want to call it that uh, to some degree. Uh, and psychocybernetics is clearly very unique in the way that it, it, it makes you look at your self-image and understand how you view yourself and get you to understand that your ability to change that, all of your success hinges you know, on this and then giving you tools to do that. I had a blind spot, much like you, um, while younger because obviously, just like you, the heavy focus on sports and, and what that can do and you, you, you visualize when you wanna win and when you wanna score goals uh, and all this stuff. And, that was very important to me, and I think I've mentioned this in another podcast. I'd never, ever, for some weird reason, ever thought that it, the same process could be used outside your life. So it was basically like, within this sport, I'm gonna, uh, I'm doing really yeah. well. I'm, I'm achieving. I'm definitely above average. I'm now a pro, and as a teenager, you know, all this stuff. But the rest of my life, not that it was bad, you know, not that anything was crazy. I didn't get into any trouble or anything like that. But I just didn't utilize any of the tools. And so for 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 people that are listening to hear you say, I rewired this and then I used it to win championships. Then I use it in places to win championships that of course no one is expecting me to win the Kung Fu championship in China. And then my business, could you break it down just to, in, a, in a way that someone who either wants to earn more money or wants to be a success or a champion like you, could you get them through just like, where do I start? Do I sit down like you and visualize success? What do I visualize? Does it, does it matter what I feel, how I feel? Is there anything that you could lay out like that? That's a great question, Will. Uh, I would say that one of the key things for me as an athlete uh, was before I would go to practice every single day, I would sit and I would visualize the type of practice I wanted to have. So what I did is I gave myself a daily goal. I had my long-term goal, my long-term vision. But if that's all you focus on is winning a state, national, world championship, and it's not going to take place till next year or something, that creates a lot of stress and anxiety. And there's no, other than the games you win or the goals you score up until that time, you still don't have a whole lot to appreciate about where you are on the journey. But when you have a goal for every practice of what you want to accomplish and you accomplish it, you're building the success mechanism. You're activating the success mechanism where you get on a roll you have momentum, and you use that momentum largely unconsciously to create even more of the results you want. You realize that 
if I if I focus on a daily goal and I hit it over and over and over, when I get into competition, it's the same thing, only it's magnified a bit. And because the success mechanism has been activated in a big way on the daily goals, you have the confidence that pushes you into these other contests and competitions with confidence, with this inner knowing that I'm going to kick butt because I'm kicking butt all the time, every day. So just to go through practice and do the physical mechanics is not enough. You have to have, you have, to have a goal. At the same time, let's say, for example, we have people listening who feel they're not good yet or that they're average. Well, that's a mental picture. And it's nothing but a mental picture. The mental picture, the self-image actually controls the framework of how far you're going to go. So if we change that mental picture, that self-image, to you rising above and becoming more than you currently are, that starts to activate your body to move in the way that is consistent with that picture. So with that, though, is you want to begin to relive. And it talks about this in the book. You want to relive the positive past. Now, you might think, well, I... I don't have it really any victories. I've never won a championship. How can I picture something I haven't done? That's not the answer. The answer is anything positive. When I was working with my son's Little League baseball team, before a game, I had the athletes visualize something they did in baseball in a game regardless of whether the team won or lost, something they did that they're proud of. And each person in the room, this is when all these boys were 11 and 12 years of age. I, I had them all say out loud, oh, I, got a, I hit a double one tonight. I made a leaping catch. I uh, was involved in a double play. We fielded the ball, threw the ball to second, and then he got thrown to first and we got the double play. Or I tagged a guy out at home or something. Just give me one thing, and it doesn't matter when it happened. This is what's cool. Because your, your brain, even though we can categorize things as past, present, future, your brain really doesn't keep track of time. It keeps track of time in, in a way of, oh, this date and this time. But when you're going back in your mind and you're reliving a successful moment, your brain doesn't know that that was the past it, because you're reliving it now. When, when I'm telling a story about growing up in Iowa, I'm actually reliving that story while I'm telling. Yes, I know it happened in the past, but as I'm remembering it and as I'm telling it, I'm reliving. So when you relive, this is key, relive one positive moment from the past, you start to tingle and vibrate at a different level. And then what you do is you take those sensations and that memory of those sensations and you implant them or inject them into the goal. So it's as though there's two mirrors. We got a mirror of what happened in the past that was really positive, And then we have a mirror here of what you want to happen in the future that is supposed to be positive. Well, if all you do is picture what it is you want, you don't have the juice from this mirror. You don't have the clear reflection. So you want to picture what it is you want in the future, but you want to put the energy 
that vibration that was in the the movie from the past, you want to put that into the mirror for the future. And so now when you think about the goal, you're vibrating the same way you were in the past. That's how it works. That's yeah. Incredible, uh, very succinct uh, summary of it. That's almost essentially how I've understood it. And like I said before, I think I've got maybe 75 or some odd, maybe 100 pages still left. But that portion of the book and uh, the reliving the positive past, I would do naturally within football, like I, like I said, in, in, in the sport. But that is definitely something that sets psychocybernetics apart. Um, and it's said and stated in different ways. And like I said, there's, it, there's an infinite number of, of ways to think about how to improve your life nowadays. We actually have an you know, overabundance of books, programs, and things to look at, but they all come down to trying to manipulate something like this. And so I'm also kind of curious because you mentioned what you did and you called it the theater of the mind. And maybe this is where you can get into a little bit. There's a section of the book that discusses an experiment that was done on, I believe, free throws. Yes. Or, and maybe you want to explain that, but at least I can preface it by saying that they were, they'd set it up by having guys who were actually practicing free throws and guys who were just pretending to shoot successful free throws. And maybe you can touch on what actually happened and then my follow-up question was simply, have you done that specifically before, and, and has it worked? Very good. Well, there's three groups in the test. There, okay. was, there was the group that they, first they tested them to get the baseline of how many free throws they could make successfully. Then they put them on a program for a month. One group practiced free throws. One group didn't do anything. The third group practiced free throws in their mind. And at the end of that period of time, the group that did not improve at all was the group that didn't practice at all in their mind or physically. The group that practiced physically improved dramatically. The group that practiced in their mind also improved dramatically, one percentage point below the group that practiced physically. But there's one group that wasn't tested. There wasn't a fourth division. And that would be, what if you had another group that practiced in their mind and physically? What would be the results of that group? That we don't know based on that study. But this has been done with archery. This has been done with, I. and to get to your question, have I practiced this myself? I'm not a basketball player, but the answer is yes. Sure. I have gone out on the court and just shot free throw after free throw after free throw. And... <laughs> I would make about four or five out of 10 on average. And then I would shoot another 10 and be about the same. Every once in a while I'd get six and then another time I would get three. So it would even out that I was about a 50% free throw shooter. And one day after reading John Wooden's book, uh, he was a famous coach at UCLA. They won 10 NCAA basketball titles in 12 years. Um, he was talking about how a player who wasn't good at free throws, he'd send him to another basket to practice while everybody else was going through the normal practice. And the command was 10 in a row, or you don't go home. It thought about that. And I'm picturing that as he's saying this. And in a row, 
or you don't eat. Let's even make it simpler. You can go home, but you don't get to eat. Well, we want to eat. And so I just started saying that to myself. All right, 10 in a row, or you don't eat. As soon as I did that, before every basket, before shooting each basket, I would picture it going through the hoop. I would see it. I would hear it making the swoosh sound, and I would feel it. Now, this doesn't take five minutes before every shot. It just takes a couple of seconds. I would see it in my mind's eye before I would shoot the ball. And something really remarkable happened. During that same practice, this isn't me doing this for a month. During that same practice, I hit nine in a row. I hit nine in a row. And my friend Nick Nurse, who actually comes from the same hometown, he was the coach for the Toronto Raptors when they won the NBA championship, his rookie year, uh, and now he's with the Philadelphia 76ers. He was in my coaching group at this time. It was 2006, I believe, maybe. That's 2007. And I told him, and he says, Nine in a row, ten in a row. <laughs> hey, you're dealing with a wrestler, Nick. I don't shoot baskets for a living. It's not my job. This is just right. a test. So I, I've done this with bowling as well. Uh, I taught myself I'm right-handed, but I got this idea in my head that it would be good to be ambidextrous. So I started learning to write cursive, not only with my right hand, but with my left and cursive with the left hand going what we would call backwards, but the technical term is actually mirror image. And I trained myself to write in mirror image left and then regular right and then in mirror image right and then lefty in the regular way from left to right. I, pra I practice this. And I, I got good at it. my handwriting. Uh, people would look at it and say, this looks as though it was the same as the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights. It's that kind of handwriting. Well, along the way, I got this ambid ambidexterity going with my handwriting. Now let's put it into a sport of some sort. So I went bowling one day. And before I would throw the bowling ball, I would picture a strike. And that day, with I hadn't bowled in 15 years or so. I bowled a 180, a 182, one, 184 that. And I was really excited. I thought, man, if I start working on this, wonder how good I could get at bowling. Well... My right arm was tired from bowling. We bowled three games, and I'm heaving that ball down the, down the alley with everything I got. And then I talked to a friend. He goes, oh, you got to take this up and get some shoes and get your own ball made. And You're using a bowling alley's ball. Get your own ball. And he started teaching me, and this guy was the lefty who bowled right-handed. So... At the, at the end of the third game, my arm was tired, so I went to my left hand, and it was a disaster. I think the first five, six bowls, balls I, I pitched down the alley went straight into the gutter. So now I got to train my left side to do what my right side can already do. What What do I have to do to make that happen? Well, first I would start with a goal. And my first goal, believe it or not, was a small one of bowling 50. Not even 100, possibly 300. <laughs> if I could right. just get 50 points, I'll be relieved. And I, I did manage to do that. Then I upgraded the goal to 100. Is, and then I shifted, I realized when I bowled right-handed, I didn't get any enjoyment. 
But as soon as I put the ball in my left hand and worked it, it lit up my brain and nervous system, and I, I felt pleasant. I felt calm. I felt energized. So I said, you know, this is similar to the same thing I've experienced writing with my left hand. So I started exclusively, only bowling left-handed because of the feeling it gave. The next goal was 100. And I would go and I'd bowl four games and I'd get 100 in one of those four games. Then I made it, well, half your games. You got to bowl 100. And then it became every game I bowl, I got to get at least 100. Well, my scores started going up in the 120s, 140s, 160s, 170s. So I started thinking about 200. Something I'd never done right-handed. My best score ever was that day where I hadn't bowled in well over 10 years when I did 184. So I have this goal of 200, and... Every time I would get close, I'd be in the ninth frame. I'd have 191 or 188 or something such as that. And I know that all I got to do is get nine pins out of a possible 30 in the 10th frame. And I'd easily break 200. I'm at 191. All I need is nine pins. Well, I'd go out and I'd throw the ball into the gutter. So now I have to get a spare in order to get another 10 pins. I have to get at least nine to hit 200. And I'd throw the ball and it would swerve and I'd end up knocking down one pin. This happened a number of times. Then... I realize, once again, this is self-image. This is a bigger goal than 100, and a much bigger goal than 50. So I started to picture myself celebrating getting 200. And secondly, I took out my pen and I wrote in a note, I will bowl 200 left hand okay. so a lot of people tell you not to use i will or i'm going to or i want to they tell you to say i am bowling 200 and i don't teach that at all that's that's not part of psycho cybernetics and it's not sure. reality and i don't want a sparring match with my <laughs> conscious and subconscious so my brain knows what the goal is if i say i want something to eat it knows, and it won't stop till I go get something to eat. So if I say I, I'm going to get something to eat, my brain knows what it's going to do. Same with I will. So I wrote I will, and I wrote it in left-handed in mirror image. The very next day, I'm driving to the bowling alley, and in the lane next to me, I can see somebody's looking at me. You know how you can feel somebody's looking at you? Sure, so sure. I turn my head to the right, and the guy goes, gives me a peace sign. That's all that was. He was giving me the peace sign. Thought nothing more of it. I go to the bowling alley and do my warm-ups for about five minutes. Then I started bowling. And it was incredible. The so-called luck that was happening that day. And... I believe luck gets activated when you have a goal and you begin to picture some coincidences happen or luck, lucky experiences happen. It's part of the deal. And I ended up bowling 203 that day. I drove home. And when I got home, it hit me. The guy in the car was telling me, <laughs> man, I'm going to bowl 200 that day. Now, you could say that I just made that up or that's how I associated it, but I did this after the fact, not before. I did it after the fact. 
So was he just saying hi with the peace sign or was he, it doesn't really matter, but these are some of the uh, events that can tell us we're headed in the right direction that we often think of as coincidences, but it's really what I would refer to as synchronicity. These are exactly be, before yeah. a, a few days before the state championships in high school, I had a dream that I beat the defending state champion, which I ended up doing in the quarterfinals. I told my mom about it. I said, I just dreamed that I beat Wayne Love in the state quarterfinals. She didn't say, oh, well, that's just a dream. So dreams can also be part of the synchronicity that are telling you what's coming in the future. So if you have positive dreams, you're doing something heroic out on the out on the field, the soccer field, baseball field, whatever it is, take those and keep them to yourself. Only tell somebody such as your mother who's going to support you, but don't blab it off to everybody else. Lock it. Totally. Keep, I, sure. I'm a big believer in keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> I, I can't agree with that so, so much more, especially now we live in times where for some reason you get the – um, if you tell someone about a goal, and I know there are studies on this, if you tell them about your future goal, you already get all the rewards from it just by telling them about your goal. If you blab about it on social media and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this and all the people come in and they already congratulate you for it. It's, it's, you don't need to achieve you know, it now. Yeah, it's done. You know, So keep it to yourself. I would agree with that. Uh, also on synchronicities, I think that that's, it's true. And I've been having these discussions with people like you and even, you know, Dr. Dean Radin, who, you know, has studied some of these things and synchronicities and consciousness. And you, you had a, an interesting quote there, how you said that you felt that you kind of activate luck, that luck gets activated in these things. And that's probably the best way of putting it. Uh, because I've seen that as well. When you get hell bent on a certain thing to happen that you know and once again you maybe didn't tell anyone that could happen and if you did tell them they would say no way you are going to do this or no way this is going to happen and then you get about doing it some sort of weird luck does happen which they will then attribute as the thing that got you what you did oh well the stars aligned and this happened and you know well you whiffed that shot but it went it went into the goal like that you didn't really mean it and you know that day that guy was injured kind of and like a series of crazy of luck right it yeah. just just happens and um they it does seem like it gets activated in a certain way and i want to shift real quick i want to read this three sentences i think they are from this and then ask you something that is pretty uh huge out in the zeitgeist right now it this is a quote from the preface actually it says uh, the self-image sets the boundaries of individual accomplishment it defines what you can and cannot do expand the self-image and you expand the area of the possible the development of an adequate realistic self-image will seem to imbue the individual with new capabilities new talents and literally turn failure into success i find that incredibly powerful and i want to go and ask and be the devil's advocate for the people who are anxious uh fearful uh doubtful of all of this right how do they in an anxious state change their self-image how do they get about and around this problem well that is uh the best question you've asked They've all been good, but this one is my <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So there are a number of ways to do this. But sometimes, for example, I, I talked about being in the stands and I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I'm doubtful. And I got out of the stands and I went somewhere else to change the feeling, right? But that wasn't enough. I had to sit in the chair and visualize what I wanted. That changed the nervousness, the anxiety, and the doubt to a positive vibration. But it's even faster than that. Uh, you, I could have actually done this in the sands. 
if I knew then what I know now. And the reason I say that is because I used to have a tremendous fear get activated when I was flying in an airplane and we'd hit turbulence. As soon as we'd hit turbulence, I'm grabbing the, the <laughs> armrests and everything's tight and I'm not breathing. And I tried many, many different modalities from saying to myself, well, I'm, I'm safe, everything's going to be all right, self-talk and so on, and changing my breathing, changing my physiology, relaxing my body, and none of it worked. All of those things can work, but what operates the machine? What is causing the nervousness, the anxiety, and the fear? A mental picture. So I asked myself, what is it I'm picturing that's causing this? And the image that came back wasn't, I don't know, it just happens. The image that came back was of something happening with that plane and all the passengers on it that is not a desirable outcome. So I just switched the picture. I changed instead of instead of thinking that, even though I was unconscious of, I'm just, you know, I'm having this so-called panic attack. It just happens to you? No. You actually were picturing something that caused this. So what were you picturing? I identified. And then what I did is I changed the image to landing safely and meeting friends and family and loved ones in the airport and having a nice meal. Sitting down, having a meal together. As soon as I did that, bang. I'm no longer gripping the armrest. I'm breathing deeply. The weight of the world has been lifted off my shoulders. My body's relaxed. All right. So I did that where I was sitting. I didn't have to go sit somewhere else to do this. Another occasion was when I was out on a boat with my family in Key West, Florida, uh, a little over a year ago. The guy picks us up. We did a private fishing expedition. And the guy pulls up, and we get in. He doesn't ask us if we want to wear life jackets. He doesn't offer any life jackets. There's no life jackets that are even visible. I'm sure they were on the boat somewhere, but they weren't even visible. No big deal. All of us know how to swim. We go out on the ocean. And it starts getting more and more treacherous, bumpy, bumpy waves, and and so on. And my wife at one, my wife and I at one point flew up into the air off the bulkhead, and we landed. And I was a bit freaked out, so we got into a squatting position on the floor instead of sitting on the bulkhead. At that point, the captain wised up and thought, well, I, I probably ought to tell them where they ought to sit. So he takes us toward the back of the boat, and there's a couple ice chests there that we can sit on and hold on to. All right. Now I'm going into these incredibly fearful images that are preposterous, that don't make any sense at all. But... When does fear make any sense? It never does, except for certain situations, of course. I shouldn't say never. But most of the time, what we're fearing is a negative use of your imagination. You're projecting yourself into the future with a mental image, and you're seeing the worst possible thing happening. As I'm sitting there with my wife, I'm picturing all sorts of horrendous situations that we're not going to come back from this trip, and he's he's taking us out there, and he's going to sink us to the bottom of the ocean. We'll never be heard from again. All of this. And 
I'm running through this, this montage of negative possibilities for about five minutes. And then I realized, whoa, this is the same as the turbulence when I'm flying. So what did I do? I switched the image to my son, my daughter, and my wife having a meal at the end of the day talking about this fishing trip. As soon as I switched the image, I started talking to the captain, who up to that point I thought was a jerk because he didn't give us any life vests and he didn't ask us and he didn't tell us where to sit to be safe, et cetera. I thought he was a jerk. And now all of a sudden he's a nice guy. I'm communicating with him. I'm talking with him and he's giving me some really good pointers and we had a great conversation. So my reality completely changed within seconds of taking the picture of doom, throwing it in the trash and putting in, in the forefront of my mind a picture of us having a happy meal, our family having a meal. So that's how quickly it works. Whenever, now, now, if you're stuck and you're the type of person who says, well, I don't know what the mental picture is. I'm just afraid. Well, the, the other way you can do it is just, just forget about what you are picturing that caused this. Maybe you're unable to find it. So you just go to this happy meal with salmon and friends, and that's good enough. But I believe it's better to know what the image is that haunts you because the more aware you are of the negative images, the easier it is to switch them out. But if somebody is in a contest, uh, in a competition, and he's freaking out on the bench, um, the answer isn't, oh, just breathe deeply, oh, just this, oh, just that. All those things can be helpful, but they're not the general. The general or the captain of the ship is the mental picture. So one of my sayings is everything in life is a mental picture. So if you have fear, nervousness, worry, self-doubt, that's a mental picture. If you have confidence, if you have courage, that's also a mental picture. So take the fearful images and just cast them overboard and focus on the courageous, confident images uh, where you're having a good time. Right. And I, I'm curious as well because it could lead to, this is a, another place where people get stuck. Um, and sp speaking specifically about the financial world and abundance and wanting to make money because what you've laid out here is that it's really important to understand your previous past victories. And there may be a lot of people out there saying, that sounds great. I can remember, you know, winning this and winning that. And do I really get to think about that one time I scored a goal when I was five and that's going to help me make money because I, I've always been poor or I've never had enough or I've always just had enough to get by. How am I supposed to use this? What am I supposed to remember? What am I supposed to think about other than, right? I can't feel myself with a million dollars or whatever it is with the cars and the house or whatever it is that you want. How do I, how do I create wealth using that, that method? Well, if you look at an image of, a $1 bill, and you can see a $1 bill, what's the difference between that and a million dollars? Six zeros. Six zeros that you have after that one. That's the only difference, is we added nothing. Six hundred. Well, now let's go further. Do you know anyone over the age of 20 who has never 
in his or her entire life receive one dollar for something. I don't care if you're out on the street <laughs> and you are panning. Somebody is giving you a doubt. <laughs> Correct? For sure. Yeah, for sure. For and sure. then assuming you have a job, so I give worst possible case. Somebody out on the street, homes. Somebody somewhere during that person's life has given him a doubt or maybe four quarters adds up to a doubt. Then you have the other person in the middle who has a, a job. And every week, this person gets a check or every two weeks or once a month. But he gets a check. Well, it's only $1,000. All right. But would you rather not have gotten that $1,000? Would you rather have that go to somebody? No, no, no. I want it. All right. So you've gotten $1,000. Now, think of it when... You had some bills that you needed to be paid, that needed to be paid, and you're stressing out. You're fearful you're not going to have the money. And now you get that $1,000, and the first thing, oh, this is great. Now I can pay off this, this, and this. Right? So there's an excitement factor. I can remember when I was given the first few dollars for shoveling the snow off people's driveway and sidewalk. Was that a positive experience? Yes. So could I use that if my goal is to make a million dollars? Of course, because all they are ultimately are mental pictures. Whether it's one dollar, whether it's three or four dollars, whether it's a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, all of those are just mental pictures. So if you have a feeling of happiness. Related to getting one dollar or a thousand or ten thousand, you have a feeling of happiness and relief associated with that. Then, what's the difference between that and putting a million in there and adding the happiness and the relief energy from the previous experience? So, you don't have to have made a million dollars to go back and relive something you've never done, Maltz lays it out in the simplest sentence ever, ever written in this book. It, it's in the beginning. It says, if you can remember, worry, or tie your shoe, you can succeed with psychocybernetics. And I'll, I would say 99.9% .9 of the people who read that sentence or ho hum, and they just move on. But for me, that sentence I can talk about for an hour. If you can remember, so he's putting memory first. If you can remember, worry. Now he's putting worry second. But what is worry? It's negative use of the imagination in the future. So he's telling you you're using your imagination. Can remember reliving the past, feeling the past, reliving the past, worry, imagining a negative future, and then tie your sheep. You can succeed. Why would he say tie your sheep? Why would he write tie your shoe. Why, why not put, if you can remember, worry, or make a million dollars, you can succeed with psycho -cybernetic. Well, how many people have done that? But if you can tie your shoes and remember, so now let's put one and three together. Remember tying your shoe. Was that not a positive experience in your life? It was for me, I've only met one person whom I asked, do you remember the time that you tied your shoes for the first time? Do you remember the first time you tied your shoes? 
I've had one person who says, no, we use Velcro. <laughs> All right, so let's find something else. Do you remember the first right. time you wrote your name on a piece of paper? Do you remember the first time that you were dribbling a basketball and you shot it to the hoop and it went in? And you yelled out to your mom and dad, say, hey, watch me, watch me. Everyone, had, those are really small in the big scope of things. Those are really small experiences, but yet they contain the seeds of greatness because of the feeling and the emotion that's contained in that memory. So you want to look now at worry, yes, it's negative use of the imagination, but you can reframe that by thinking of positive. So instead of, I'm worried that we're going to lose, I'm worried that we're going to win. <laughs> so now you just add, and you just change what's at the end. I'm worried I'm going to make a million dollars and enjoy my life. <laughs> I'm worried that no. my son is going to be the MVP of the league. So you can still have the word worry in there, but now you, you've changed the ending of it, and that, that's another way that changes the mental picture so that you get a desired result as opposed to an undesired one. And, yeah, what I think most people, what I find funny is in the methods and the books that I've read, when they break it down, when someone understands it, you know, to, to your level, they always make it this simple. They always make it so simple. And, and so many people who I think have been struggling with trying to figure out what works, want it to be, it must be, it can't possibly be as simple as it's laid out here, right? There has to be some sort of complex formula that's just all force and all work hard and all this and whatever it is, rather than changing how I think and that how I think is affecting my relationship with the world and the reality and all these things. And, and so I've always found that truth can be incredibly simple. And it, because it's so simple, it's so easy to use. And it's also so easy not to to do it's so easy to ignore yeah also very good point. and i think people fall into that trap right yeah of just thinking well if it's that easy i just won't do it you know i'll just do something else and you know i can just do do this and so uh i mean i obviously we're already over i appreciate all this where else should people go apart from obviously recommending guys i haven't even finished this book i can already tell you it is it is i i read a lot and we're constantly talking about the books I read and we're constantly having the authors. This has been one of the most influential books I have read, if not the most influential book I have read this year. And uh, I'm not done. Well, and <laughs> so, I, I'll add to that, Will, is that every time you read it, you'll be saying it again. So, oh. it, it's not a book you read one time. It's a book, right. I've been reading it since 1987. And I'm still <laughs> just, oh my God goodness, this is huge. I got to write about this yeah. today. And yet I've read yeah, yeah. it dozens and dozens of times. I, I have the audio version of it that I recorded. You can get it at audible.com. You can get Psycho-Cybernetics, the audible version of this, this same book, as well as my Theater of the Mind program done with uh, Nightingale Conant. And then I have a coaching program that is primarily my theater of the mind master's newsletter. Comes out once a month, it's digitally delivered, and this newsletter is not really a newsletter. There's no fluff. In it. The entire thing, and it's not cheap, all right? It's not cheap. It's expensive sure. because the material that is going into this is the same as if I was sitting in a room with you for a number of hours guiding you and coaching you. So it's really a coaching newsletter, and it is huge. I send it out on the 7th of every month. You get it digitally, and I tell my subscribers, 
print this thing out. Do not read it on your computer. Print it out so that the brain is activated through the fingertips, the brain sure. is activated through the hands. You print it out, you get a pen in your hand, you get a highlighter as I saw you have, and you have a notepad. Yeah. So if we look at you, you've that shown me you have a pen, a notepad, and a highlight. Notepads oh. are there, yeah. That, that yeah. leaves a clue. You don't just read something on your screen. So people print this thing out, and they end up they end up writing me and saying, "How do I get the back issues?" They don't want to miss anything. Uh, again, it, it's not for everyone. I I have the price on this set at a premium, so that I only get the people who want the real marrow. Uh, they're getting the essence of what it takes. Sure. But the whole thing is, as you said simplify. I simplify this and make it so easy to comprehend and most importantly, to implement into your life so that you start getting results immediately. That That's the whole key. That's awesome. and, and going yeah. back to that basketball story, that wasn't a one-off where I just got lucky one day. Uh, I tested that multiple times where I'd go there and I wouldn't picture and I was hitting four out of 10. And then I would picture and hit nine. I've never hit 10 out of 10, but I've hit nine out of 10 many, many times. But this is, I do it. Let's say the first time I did it was 2001. And then in 2012, I did it again. And most recently in 2020, I did it a number of times and then I haven't shot a basketball since 2020. So many different times in my life, I've done the same thing. And of course, if I, if I really cared enough to shoot baskets every day, I'm sure I could hit 10 in a row, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I, I'll exactly. take nine yeah. out of 10 any. <laughs> Yeah, especially when, yeah, if you're practicing in your mind for a little and then taking years off and then sinking 9 out of 10, anybody would take that percentage. Yeah. I forgot to mention the website. Uh, the, web, the website you can go to to you know, find the coaching link at the top is psycho-cybernetics.com. So the same as the book. We'll put it Same there. as the book, the psycho, yeah. and then there's a hyphen cybernetics.com. I have a daily email I send out and uh, where I do Q&A with people. So if people have questions, they can send them in and I cover them in the daily uh, email. But the real essence and marrow that goes even deeper into it is in the coaching newsletter. So we will link to all of that, obviously, if you guys are watching this and it's in the description, uh, obviously it's in the show notes if you're, if you're just listening to this. It's already a podcast that you have to go back and listen to. Just like he said, I agree with that wholeheartedly. You've got to go back. I love writing things down to clarify. If you don't, sometimes they just stay vague in your mind. No, you don't have to write everything down. Yes, you can be successful without doing it. But clearly, by clarifying things, by writing some stuff down, it does it does help and can help too. So for sure, go back, listen to all this. I obviously will as well. And then, uh, you know, take action. So Matt, I'm, uh, I appreciate all the time. Uh, we'll definitely have to do this again. If I'm back in the U S there sometime, yeah. you have to come by and we'll do it in person. That'd be great. You come down to Florida, awesome. we'll, we'll meet, greet, and we'll make some great video it. together. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Will. I've enjoyed being on this and, and, uh, the people watch this, take notes and, and even better, as you said, watch more than once. They're going to be astounded with the breakthroughs they have. Totally. All right, guys, that's it. We'll see you later. And, and thanks again. Thank you, Will.